Right now on Law and Crime Report, protesters, family, and attorneys react to allegations that a drug overdose, not police brutality, caused George Floyd's death. It was an overdose of excessive force and racism by the Minneapolis Police Department. Plus, we discuss how a former NFL player was arrested for allegedly using a coronavirus business relief loan on luxury goods. And later, Los Angeles police are still looking for the suspect who fired into a parked police vehicle, critically injuring two officers. This is the Law and Crime Report, diving into true crime and the legal stories making headlines. It's Monday, September 14th, 2020. Welcome to Law and Crime Report. I'm your host, Bob Bianchi, and we even have more than that. We got some great guests. But let's start about George Floyd. As you know, motions are being filed in court to dismiss the charges against the police officers. And during one of those motions, the defense lawyers argued that Mr. Floyd was under the influence of fentanyl that he had taken at the scene, and that was his cause of death. That had led to a massive rebuke by the family as well as the family's attorney. Let's take a listen. He didn't die of natural causes. He died because of a knee being on his neck. The autopsy said he died of asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Jealousy. Jealousy. That's, that's what the autopsy said. He did not die of an overdose. No. Man. I ask that everybody stand with us in solidarity as we tirelessly go through everything that we have to go through with the court. Because they're going to prolong this as long as they can. Because they have no ability at all to say that that video was right. That was wrong. They killed him. This is worldwide. The nation is standing behind us, and we all need to come together and realize that we need to stop this. This is wrong. We need justice, and we demand that. When you look at this from a legal perspective, the causation perspective, those drugs did nothing to him because we know that he had situational awareness. He was cooperative. He was begging to do what we all are doing as a matter of right, and that is breathing. He wanted an oxygen exchange between his brain and his lungs, and he was denied that when he asked, please, may I breathe? That, that drug defense is desperate. It will fail and it's false. Okay, we have Gene Rossi with us today, law uh, crime legal analyst, 30 years at the DOJ, and Dina Dahl, a journalist, lawyer, certified mediator, legal analyst, also at the Law and Crime Network. Welcome to the show, guys. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Let me, let me start with you, Gene. Um, the lawyer brought out at the end a word causation. Can you explain yeah. to our audience the importance of causation with respect to a murder charge? All right, as a federal prosecutor, I tried, charged a lot of um, overdose deaths and, and possible non-fatal overdoses. And in, in the federal system, the uh, drug, I think it was fentanyl, they're going to argue, was the uh, overriding cause that resulted in his death. So there can't be any intervening factors. So what they're arguing is, Bob, is that the fentanyl, not the knee on the neck and the other uh, restraints, for eight, eight minutes and 46 seconds, that caused his death rather than the knee and the other things. I have to right. say, it's an argument you can make. I don't know how strong it is. Yeah, and, and I saw, Dina, some news accounts about, um, you know, obviously people are upset about that. You need to understand that for sure, uh, because the autopsy, uh, there were a number of autopsies done that showed that the physical, mechanical uh, issue was the cause of death. But these are arguments that defense lawyers make all the time across the country, day in and day out. It's happening right now with regard to trying to attack causation. So uh, putting aside the court of public opinion, what are your thoughts about this in terms of its efficacy from a legal point of view? Well, you know, you hit on it because I, there was a reference that the, the fact that the defense attorney was even bringing this up showed maybe racism in the criminal justice system. 
but it actually shows maybe a reflection of society, right? Because the prosecution actually has the mantle of government, and the defense really is only going to put forward an argument that the society is going to accept, because the jury is a microcosm of our society. And unfortunately, victim shaming, and in particular, shaming of addicts or people who use drugs, is socially acceptable in our society. And that's why the defendant, defense is willing to put this argument out there. Yeah, Gene, just real quick, uh, and, and, and uh, also you, Dina, I, I'm interested. The prosecution is going to be arguing that people are under the influence of drugs all the time and that their training and experience would have warranted under those circumstances to even use less force in the situation would be my opinion, as far as Chauvin is concerned, the officer who had his knee on the neck. So I want you to comment on that. And what do you think the effect is with regard to the other officers, especially Officer Tao? I keep, I keep bringing this up, who was doing the crowd control. How does that bear on him saying, we didn't have shared intent. It was Chauvin doing something you shouldn't have been doing, and possibly these drugs, whatever it was, we were doing crowd control. Uh, any thoughts on that, Gene, either one well, of those areas? On the first point, the uh, defense about causation, the autopsy is going to be very important. If there were drugs in a system, what was the level? And then you'd have an expert to talk about, you know, how would it affect the body and the respiratory system? So you could have a battle of experts, and that's never good for the government when you have a battle of experts on a key fact. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Tao, who was standing around, sort of the, uh, the one uh, controlling the crowd, he's being charged with aiding and abetting. And if he can show that he didn't have the requisite intent to aid and abet what happened, then he's got a pretty good argument that he was just trying to control the crowd. I wasn't really involved in these altercations with the uh, Mr. Floyd. So he probably has the best defense of the four officers. Yeah, and, and Dina, to, I, I'd like you to comment on what Gene just said, and also keeping in mind, because I know this is a very hot topic, and when you read the commentaries with all our great commentators here at the Law and Crime Network, we're, we're not justifying anything here. We're just talking about how lawyers operate in the courtroom, what the law right. is, and what lawyers typically do. We're not passing on judgment on whether it was right or wrong. It's about the law in the end, and can you prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt? What are your thoughts, Dana? You know, as to the officer, Chow, who was a little bit removed, it, you have to think of it in a context of a crime, right, which this is what they are alleging. And what he was was actually keeping people who could have helped prevent the crime from interfering, the crowd, right? I mean, there is a 911 call from an off-duty fire man, like, who was across the street, who called in and said, they are killing this man. These police officers are killing this man. If I was a prosecutor, I would run that tape. Of course Chow knew that. He was so much closer to some of those other people who, a, a few people called 911, and he was effectively keeping people away who could have intervened. If you look at it from a criminal context, I just think the prosecution has a good argument even against him. You know, I, I think that's an excellent point, although I, I don't think that encouraging people to intervene in a police action is a good idea. But I think what you're saying also is that it goes to what Officer Tao knew um, at the time because he was hearing it being yelled back at him. So he may have had that affirmative duty to do something. Very interesting points, guys. Thank you so much. Let's listen to Ben Crump, the attorney for the family, and his response. That killed George Floyd was an overdose of excessive force and racism by the Minneapolis Police Department. Let's just be clear about that. Right, a few more questions. Mr. Cohn, what do you think about the other arguments made, the push to change the venue, also the push? The only goal they have in trying to change venues is to get as many jurors as possible who do not look like George Floyd. They don't want jurors that look like you. No, they do not. Guys, very impassioned civil rights advocates here. Let's make sure it's clear these attorneys represent the family in the civil action. Um, I go to this point a lot of times, again, very impassioned, don't necessarily disagree, but give me your opinions about the outward statements in the outside the court of public opinion, as opposed to inside the courtroom, where they should be making the arguments, the media can report on those arguments. These press conferences, I just hope this just doesn't become a thing routinely in every case that aren't high profile, Gene, because I think it really makes jury selection that much more difficult. I think they're shooting themselves in the foot, no pun intended. 
And here's why. If I were the attorneys for the family and, and, and the, the relatives of George Floyd, I get their emotion, I get their passion, I get their pain, their agony. But all you're doing is poisoning. You are poisoning the jury pool yeah. so that the motion to change venue has now been given some strength by the defendants. These press conferences are not helping the argument of the prosecutors that we can get a fair and impartial jury. These press conferences are actually helping the defense get this move to a rural county in northern Minnesota. Prediction, it is going to be granted to change a venue. Yeah, Dina, to Gene's point, um, you know, as a prosecutor in this case, I would be asking for a gag order with respect to these things. And I know that that's a tough thing to do because to Gene's point, you say you don't want to change a venue, but you're doing the very thing that the defense lawyers are going to use in the motion to get the change of venue. Thoughts? Yeah, I would argue the opposite point. This reminds me a lot of the Harvey Weinstein case where they also requested a change of venue. I mean, I don't think there's anywhere in the world you could get a jury of 12 people who have not heard this case. Mm -hmm. The genie is way out the bottle at this point. And not only that, but yes, this is about a legal case. But this is news that has become bigger than this legal case. It is a criminal justice, social justice, Black Lives Matter reform around the country. This is news and the reason why we're talking about it this morning, too. People need and have a right to know about what's going on in this case. And I don't think this is going to harm them in terms of change of venue at all. Talking yeah, about it. It, and it may not, Dina, uh, in the end analysis, and you may be very right, the Harvey Weinstein's an excellent case to uh, reference to. But again, as a prosecutor, when I prosecuted cases, I didn't want to give defense lawyers arguments, period, whether they won or lost. I, that makes sense. But like I said, I think the family really see this as much bigger than this one case. And they believe there's a reason why our courtrooms are open, because public knowledge about a case is seen as vital in this country. And they're trying to get across what they see as misinformation and really bad conduct by trying to change the venue and things like that. And they're trying to get people to know, hey, this is happening to us. They feel like they're being wronged and they want the public to know. And that's why we have public hearings. Yeah, Gene, Dina raises a good point there. I mean, <clears throat> it could go beyond just the merits of a legal case. They want there to be a national movement and they want it to continue. And if that is their first and foremost goal, these press conferences certainly are very good at doing that. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's a good argument, but with the utmost, utmost respect to Dina, uh, Timothy McVeigh was transferred from uh, Oklahoma to Colorado. Uh, the uh, sniper case in my area, I live in Alexandria, that was moved within the state to another part of the state because obviously everybody heard of the sniper case. So those are two precedents for moving a case. Now, if you ask the prosecutors who did the OJ case, the biggest mistake they made is not moving the case from the Brentwood district to another part of California. So Dina has a point, but I think these, these press conferences are just adding fuel to the defendant's argument that I can't get, my client can't get a fair trial in Minneapolis. Then the defense being uh, the police officers in this case, sometimes yeah. that can get confusing. Great commentary, guys. Awesome arguments. Uh, I love it. We're going to take a quick break. we got a lot more here on the Long Crime Report. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law and Crime Report. I'm your host, Bob Bianchi. Let's change gears. We're back in Georgia again. Rodwick Walker, uh, an individual who was riding in a rental car with his girlfriend and their child or his child. Uh, he was a passenger. The vehicle was pulled over for a taillight infraction. When the officers asked him for his identification, him not being the driver, he asked them why. They asked him to exit the vehicle, and an encounter ensued that we're going to show you. But we warn you, this is disturbing content. Oh, God! 
Okay, Dina, I want to throw to you first. Um, this is a, another situation in which it was a minor infraction, a tail light scenario. And I understand that that has nothing to do with resisting arrest and so on and so forth. Yet, uh, one of the arguments that's out there, and it's a valid one, is people are dying or being physically abused over these minor offenses. Now, we do not have the video of what preceded this. And this always disturbs me because... Uh, there's a lot of anger, and there's a lot of commentary, and then we get the, the interview that preceded it, and we see potentially in some instances uh, some idea of why it was the officers acted that way. Again, we are not justifying what the officers did. One of these officers has already been fired, and the other one is suspended. Dina, what are your thoughts about this police encounter? You know, I, I think you are raising an excellent point about how these very minor infractions have blown up so big. And the fact that he wasn't even driving the car and was asked for his ID. And then, like you said, we don't know what transpired right after that, but he, uh, he didn't want to give it to him. And the fact that that blew up so much, it just, I think this, this is that that people are so angry about is how somebody does something so minor, right? I mean, he's literally just being a passenger in a car. He's not even driving the car. And then his interaction with police escalated to such an extent that, to see that video that we saw. And it's that escalation from something so minor to uh, so big that people are so angry about. And it is that point, too, that I, you know, I you, he you hear the counter to some of these arguments of, oh, you know, um, I think it's it's like I like to see it as you know this is somebody receiving I mean here obviously not but in George Floyd's case capital punishment for something like allegedly doing a twenty dollar counterfeit bill when we think of it in that context we can see how horrible it is to use excessive force because this person hasn't had a benefit of a trial an arrest or anything like that but when it's a being done by a police officer, it's being done by the government. And it's that type of excessive punishment to such a small alleged infraction. Right. You know, Gene, I, I uh, talked to somebody who's a retired lieutenant at NYPD in the tactical patrol force back in the day. Uh, they, they had a reputation of being a little heavy handed. And it goes like to the Gardner case, you know, you, dying over the Lucy cigarettes. And, you know, even he looks at it and he's a very, very pro cop, you know, person. He's like, ah, you know, some of these things, it depends on what the offense is when you're using that kind of overwhelming force. Uh, again, I don't know what precipitated it, and police officers don't have to fight a fair one, but what are your thoughts about this case? I think what, what the whole country needs to start doing when we have uh, criminal justice reform is we can't focus on excessive force. We have to focus on what is reasonable force, mm -hmm. because if you focus on that, then you'll understand excessive force. What was the reasonable force, if any, that these two sheriff deputies should have used to obtain the ID from this gentleman? And they just went beyond what any normal person would do. And Bob, you and I worked with cops for, for decades, thousands, probably 100,000 police officers. 98 percent, 95 are honest people. It's that 5 percent, the rotten apples that aren't trained properly that are renegade, that are rogue. It's like attorneys. I can think of 5% of attorneys who are crooked to the core. Get rid of them. And what I saw in that video was this. Two officers that don't understand how to use reasonable, reasonable approaches for a minor offense, failure to give an ID. That's what bothers me the most. Well, Gene, uh, yeah, you hit it right on the head. And let me just say two things. I'm not even sure constitutionally they can require somebody to give an ID. Mm -hmm. I, I know in New Jersey you can. I'm not sure if that's state or federal, but I'm pretty confident it's federal unless there's some reason that they believe you've committed a crime. That's number one. Number two, uh, it's shocking to me, at least in some story I read with regard to not necessarily this case, is that some states are actually implementing, listen wow. to this, Gene, uh, Dina, 
They're implementing the crazy idea that you should only use the force necessary to accomplish the result. In other words, you shouldn't use excessive force. I can't even believe uh, that they're patting themselves on the back to coming to that conclusion after all this time. And you know what? It puts officers at risk because they're following training. And you're, to your point, that training really needs to be updated. Let's switch gears though, guys. A former NFL player, uh, Josh Bellamy, charged and arrested on a multi-million dollar loan scam. Um, yeah, this is a crazy case. Got, got, got the personal uh, protection money uh, from the government for COVID-19. Apparently was using it for things like gambling and clothes and uh, giving away for you know uh, millions and millions of dollars. Um, guys, any thoughts about uh, Gene, I'm going to start with you because you were kind of in this area as a fraud prosecutor, and I would imagine that the federal government is going to go very heavy-handed with people that abuse that money, especially in light of so many people that needed it that couldn't get it. Well, the Justice Department brought those indictments, and I can tell you this. Uh, where I used to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Eastern District in Alexandria, they have a task force there focusing on the PPE program or PPP program. And I got to tell you, there's nothing that pleases a prosecutor more than attacking corruption and fraud, but then finding a bigger fish like this Mr. Bellamy, all right? And what he did with the money was just total, categorical, incontrovertible greed. And that's the best fraud case of all. Yeah, Adina, to Gene's point, I mean, you know, when you talk about filing charges like this, there are some cases that are, ah, it is what it is, and there are some cases where prosecutors are going to make a point I, as a former prosecutor, would be making a point with this, not only because of the high-level personality who's got money to begin with, but the absolute abuse. I want to send a message. This will not be tolerated. And this kind of thing is almost as serious as a violent crime. In many ways, people are suffering greatly because of this. Absolutely. And I was struck by the speed of which they brought these charges. I mean, the money was just dispersed in April, and we're at September very quick. And I don't think it's a coincidence because I think in October, so just a few weeks away from now, people who receive these loans, they have a duty to say whether or not it is going to be treated as a loan or a grant. If it's a, if they didn't use it as they said they were going to use it in the application, I mean, not as fraudulently as this, but in different parts of their business, then it's going to be a loan and not a grant. And so I think the timing of putting this case on somebody who's so hope, high profile right before that kind of puts notice to everyone else who got these loans that if you did not use them as you said you were going to use them, you have to pay them back. Very similar, Gene, uh, to Dina's point to the Sandy funds for Hurricane Sandy. Um, right. And the state went very heavy on it. Gene, can you give me an idea of where this falls in the guideline range in the federal sentencing? And I, I don't want to put you on the spot with that, but w what is he looking at as far as time-wise is concerned? And what do you think a plea offer reasonably would look like here? Well, I think the guidelines for the amount of loss is probably going to put him at level 28, which is five years. Uh, that's the guidelines. If he, if he uh, pleads guilty, then the guideline range could probably get down to two to three years. But the guidelines are advisory. The government could recommend probation or a lighter sentence. But I think at the end of the day, the government's going to recommend some incarceration. Absolutely. It's similar to that uh, SAT scam with uh, the actresses out in Hollywood. They'll have to serve some time. It's not going to be, you know, Sing Sing and Alcatraz, but they are going to serve some time even if they plead guilty. Yeah, I, I see him getting, a little, obviously, more than that, because this was, at least from the articles that we're reading, was for sheer greed, as opposed to parents who made a misguided attempt to try to help their children. Not that it's justified legally, but it's certainly something a judge can take into consideration. I, I'm, I'm thinking he's going to go on the higher uh, higher end of wherever that guideline range is. Jane, thank you so much. Dina, great commentary. we got to take a quick break. Stay with us. we still got a lot more on the Law & Crime Report. At approximately 7 p.m. this evening, at the Compton Terminal of the Blue Line, the MTA Blue Line, there was uh, two deputies who were ambushed by a gunman in a cowardly fashion. They were both critically injured, multiple gunshot wounds. They are currently uh, being treated for at the hospital. Okay, that's the sheriff in the case. Uh, Dina and Gene, I want to read you a tweet 
that the sheriff Villanueva uh, wrote um, what this was going on. To the protesters blocking the entrance and exit of the hospital emergency room, yelling, we hope you die, referring to two LA sheriffs ambushed today in Compton. Do not block emergency entries and exits to the hospital. People's lives are at stake when ambulances can't get through. Guys, listen, this is the kind of thing that this, these are two innocent police officers that were just on the job. I believe one is a mother um, and they've done nothing wrong. I, I believe in police reform. I advocated for it, but it is this kind of response. People protesting and yelling that they hope the police die who did nothing wrong and blocking entrances into a hospital so emergency vehicles can't get in. That is just not helping their cause. Full stop, Gene. Okay, uh, I, I believe that every human being has a compassionate and moral compass. And the police who engage in excessive force and uh, attack protesters unjustifiably, shame on them. I also say that protesters who engage in violence of any political stripe, who engage in violence against the police, that should be condemned. What this person did is beyond the pale, and what those individuals who are standing outside the hospital, I think they have lost their compassionate and moral compass. One is a 31-year-old mother, and they both had only been on the force for 14 months. And this is their reward. They get shot by, it appears, just looking at that, that appears to be a younger individual. So these younger kids are developing this hatred for the police, if it is a young kid. And it's just a sad commentary on society as it exists today. Violence is never proper, period. Yeah, Dina, to Gene's point, if, if I've been in the room when you're trying to balance the equities between policing and criminal justice reform. And when you have incidents like this and the trust that the police are afraid of the community, they believe they can be randomly shot. But moreover, that's just one person who did it. But when they have a pile of protesters saying that they hope they die, it makes the opportunities to have meaningful reform and meeting halfway in some instances or changing things completely, in my mind, virtually impossible. Um, what are your thoughts about this? You know, I think that this is just an example of how much we need to treat each instance based on the person, right? Like somebody who is black wants to be treated as their own individual and not as a mass. And the police officers are the same way. They want to be treated for who, how they are acting and not as a group maybe is acting. And this is a reflection of this kind of breakdown, right? In both directions. But the, I think we should not um, kind of give more attention to the protesters at the hospital because I saw some video of it and there were not that many, okay? I mean, we saw what protesting looks like in Los Angeles. And this was not people taking to the street in celebration of the killing of this officer. You know, I'm from this area, and the police here have actually done an amazing job of cleaning up the, the LAPD, working with the community for years. I mean, we've had corruption scandals, but the last years have actually been a really good job. And we haven't seen the kind of cases out of our officers that we've seen across the country. And I think there is actually a lot more support for our officers than this incident shows, both by obviously the terrific shooting and by the, I call, stragglers of people who were at that hospital. It's awful that they were there, but this was not a community rising up in support of that killing. You know, Dina, if I take the, the comment you just made and something that Gene Rossi said before, the fact of the matter is there could be, quote unquote, bad apples maybe on the police as on the police side, as well as on the protester side. You tend to look at these things with, with the, the cops do that are put on video and it looks horrible, but it represents, it, in my mind, a small fraction. But by the same token, you look at this and it looks horrible and may represent a small fraction of people that would say, we hope they die. Uh, that is really, really an excellent point. But the optic, nevertheless, starts going down political lines. And, and again, it, it may not be the majority on each side of those equations, but it has a powerful impact on public opinion. Let's listen to the sheriff, though, as he discusses the uh, critically injured officers. Well, they're both suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, they're out of surgery right now, so we're gonna keep them in our thoughts and prayers. 
One is a 31-year-old mother of a, of a six-year-old boy. Her uh, husband is here with them. The other one is a 24-year-old. And uh, parents are here, girlfriend is here. They're both out of class 437, so they just graduated. And in fact, I swore them into office just 14 months ago. These are real people doing a tough job, and uh, it just shows uh, just the dangers of this job in the blink of an eye. Gene, to that point, the dangers of the job in a blink of an eye, uh, which gets back to that training issue. Uh, these officers, this reminds me, it's reminiscent of the two officers that were shot and killed in New York City uh, back in 2014. Um, this is what puts cops on guard. It, it, you know, obviously it's a very dangerous job, but I mean, wow, you got two people in a vehicle that have already been taking a police action and some maniac comes up and just shoots them dead. It's a rough job. It's a very rough job. And any, you ask any police officer at any level, when they do a car stop at night when it's very dark and they're approaching that vehicle on the left or the right, and the inside of the car is not illuminated, I can tell you this, there's not one officer who doesn't think, this could be my last day on earth. And every time they perform their duties, they can be hurt. But, but you gotta balance that. It's like what Dina just said. Whenever we have violence on any side, regardless of political view, you can't just say that one incident means that everybody with that view or everybody affiliated with the police is of that ilk. It's just like you can't make the uh, conclusion that that person who just shot at the two cops, that everybody in Compton's like that, what appears to be a young kid. You can't say everybody in Compton wants to go shoot the police. You can't say that. So yeah, we gotta be very careful. Dina, Gina's so right, but I'll tell you, I've had a couple of conversations about this with folks um, and, and support of the protests, and I believe, I believe in the police reform, the things that need to be done, there's no question about it, mm. who threw this right up in my face. Look, at this was on multiple people that talked about it. Look what they, they did with those guys out in L.A. at the hospital. I, I mean, I get what you're all saying. What can we do to deliver a message that just this small microcosmic thing that you see, good or bad, on one side of the equation or the other, doesn't represent the whole? How do we get there, Dina? I think we keep on having these conversations. It is so easy as people. We almost want to identify as a group, right? It's just easier to function that way. If we could say this group is that and that group is this, but really that never works. And we just have to realize, take it back to our individual life. You know, I have a friend who is both African-American and I have a friend who's also a police officer and I treat that person as that person. And we have to just bring it back in. You know, sometimes the conversation can get too big and look at our individual lives and how we treat each individual people in our own lives and take it from there. Yeah, excellent point. You know, this, uh, this, this climate though, Gene, politically, uh, each side is also taking advantage of this, or you, maybe people could reasonably argue by it, but it's bled into the political system. I know you're a, a political junkie. Um, I am. I am. Uh, what are your thoughts about how politicians are <laughs> well, using these things? Here's the thing. When I ran unsuccessfully for lieutenant governor, you know, I was a D, okay? And I got to tell you, when I had people say to me, you know, all people on the other side are racist, they're all deplorable. I say, you're never going to win their hearts and minds by saying that they're racist and they're deplorable. You never persuade somebody by throwing ad hominem attacks at them. You persuade somebody and bring somebody into your camp by appealing to their compassion, reason, and logic, and not being narrow-minded and bigoted yourself. Because racism exists at all levels of society since they invented the fire and the wheel, and we're never going to get rid of it. It's like prostitution. But what you have to do is understand it exists, and you have to understand how to treat it. But you're never going to eliminate it. We're all different, and we look at things differently because of who we are. We have to understand that. So, Dina, what are your thoughts? Great, great commentary, Gene. Dina, what are your thoughts about how this is bleeding into the political system um, and its effect it will have on the election? It's definitely going to have an effect on the election. I mean, it's definitely fired up both of the bases and, you know, both of the leaders are, are talking to this. Uh, you know, I, even if we cannot fully get rid of racism, I think we have to try. And 
there are we have two people running for president right now. They have two completely opposite viewpoints on how to solve this issue. And I think they have energized people in both camps who agree with them. And I'm hoping that after this election, we have some sort of more common goal, because I can know right now if somebody's a Republican or Democrat, just based on their viewpoint of this and how they talk about this, it has become like a different language. And to your point before, how do we get over this? We cannot talk about this if we don't have some sort of common language. I really hope in the next few, this is such a huge problem. I mean, racism, discrimination, violence, um, I, you know, this discrimination against officers, discrimination mm. against minorities, we have to get better at this. And we won't if we continue to look at it from such different points of view. Yeah, guys, excellent commentary. Listen, we're going to take a quick break. But on the other side of that, the Oregon fires that are just burning out of control, well, there's a suspect in that case. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Law and Crime Report. I'm your host, Bob Bianchi. Well, these fires are raging in Oregon. You all know it. You've seen it. Uh, the worst fires ever in the history of the country, I believe, and they're keep going, and now they may be joining. It's really horrible. So many, so many billions of dollars of damages, homes destroyed, lives lost. Um, but we have right now in Oregon, uh, they're still raging, but uh, Michael Jared Bakella was been, has been charged with two counts of arson, 15 counts of criminal mischief, and 14 counts of reckless endangering. Uh, Dina, do we know anything more about what's going on? You're, you're out in that area. Do, what, just tell us about the ravaging of what's happening out there, California as well, um, and how bad this really is, and what information you have about this person that's been charged. Well, in terms of him being charged, they haven't given us that much information. It started like the, the fire is called the Alameda fire up in Oregon. And he didn't start the entire fire, but he started a fire in Phoenix, Oregon, which then joined with the existing Alameda fire, which grew. They have not figured out yet who started the Alameda fire. I think they do believe it might be arson. They found um, a dead body around the origin of that fire. So there's a criminal investigation as well as an arson investigation going on. We don't know much more about that. But yeah, here in California, even where I am, I know, like you said, there's fires everywhere here. And we are all, you know, in this pandemic, trapped in our house, not able to go outside. The air quality is still bad today. It's been bad many days. And the fires around Los Angeles is a bobcat fire. It's still going strong. It's hard to know what this is going to, how long this is going to continue to go. Gene, uh, your thoughts about the fires in general, and can you explain to our audience uh, if they do connect him to a death that occurred as a result of the arson? Talk to us a little bit about the felony murder rule. Oh, God. Felony murder rule, as you know, Bob, if I commit a felony, if I rob a bank, if I commit arson, if I, um, if I commit felony assault and it re results in death, uh, you may not have attended, intended for someone to die, but you, con you committed a felony, the reasonable consequence of which could be death. So if you go and rob a bank and you got two conspirators and then they go into the bank, you're the driver, and they shoot the teller, uh, you may not have intended for that teller to be killed, but you can be charged with murder under the felony murder rule because of your conspirator's actions. And if you went in and all you wanted to do was rob and you ended up killing somebody. Yeah, Gene, as a homicide prosecutor, that felony murder rule was always our ace card yep. in our pocket. Uh, if we weren't able to prove a purposeful or knowing murder, the felony murder was always there for us and carried at least in New Jersey the same amount of time uh, as an actual murder conviction itself. Let's switch gears a little bit, guys, to a 1984 cold case murder of a 14-year-old, Wendy Jerome, uh, who has uh, finally led the charges against a 56-year-old, Timothy Williams. The, cr the case was cracked using <laughs> familial DNA uh, that was put through, I believe it was Ancestry.com's uh, DNA database. Yet another case, guys, where law enforcement, it wasn't in their database, they were able to make this link from people that are providing voluntarily their own DNA 
and then going through those databases to ultimately come to this kind of arrest. The family is obviously elated, saying they can finally rest us. Uh, so far, of course, it's just an allegation. Uh, it looks like excellent police work, and that DNA is hard to get around, Gene Rossi. <laughs> well, uh, just ask the Golden State murderer. And um, this, is, this is a testament to great, great police work and uh, technology. And I guess the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the DNA uh, uh, ge geology, ge I can't even pronounce it, but um, it's ancestry DNA, finally. Uh, this is a testament to the beauty of that, and more people and more cold cases are going to be solved as a result of it. You know, Dina, I, I, this is a great thing from a law enforcement perspective, but I, I, I want to play a little bit on the other side of it. It is a little big brotherish, blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is these people voluntarily gave their DNA over. Um, talk to me about your feelings about that. And moreover, I've always said I will do it. I'm not worried about being caught for a crime. I'm wondering how many other things that they're going to use your DNA for that's going to start being used for like insurance premiums and risk of death and I don't know, whatever. It's just going to be a plethora of amount of stuff they can get from that. Am I just being overly conspiratorial? Thoughts? <laughs> definitely not. Right of, right of privacy is definitely a real thing here. It's interesting, though, because he didn't actually even necessarily give his DNA to this website. It just had to be a family member. Right. And that has happened, again, with the Golden State Killer, and we saw it with uh, the murder of Michelle earlier that he was convicted of. That So there you go, right? Your, your privacy could have been violated, and it wasn't even you that consented to it. But since even that this uh, case happened, we have we are seeing the laws change on this. I mean, and we are even seeing the private companies change on this. The one that was so open that the Golden State Killer was able, the police were able to get his thing. They have now restricted it where the people have to consent. Before it was just open to the police officers to be able to use it whenever they wanted to. And uh, f the federal laws have changed on this as well. So they are trying to balance this idea of privacy and prosecution. It is amazing to be able to find a murder after 36 years based on this evidence. And so as a member of the public, I don't entirely want this to go away. But like you said, yes, I also feel like my information is to be protected. I have right to know of it. I, this is just the beginning of this. Like the laws and the court cases are going to really develop over these next 10 years. And it will be interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, Gene, I want to go back to old school, old days. Let's wind that clock back there to the, to the 80s. And uh, trying homicide cases, many of them, I, I think virtually everyone I tried uh, until I left being an assistant prosecutor uh, was blood evidence was there, but we couldn't even get it analyzed. Quantico, Virginia had a lab, yep. but like it had to be something like a senator or a president before they would use it. We weren't even really sure what DNA was. And we would have to just go in and use uh, inferences uh, we could get blood type and stuff of that nature, but wow, how far we have come along. And an interesting thing, because I know that you're a, a trainer of you know, baby prosecutors for many, many years, as we call them, um, is the idea that they have to learn how to try a case even beyond the DNA. Sometimes they forget that. Oh, absolutely. And I got to add a little levity. You said plethora, but for a second, I thought you said polenta, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, no, no. When I trained my Rossi baby knows I hate polenta. Go ahead. Yeah. Adina, mm -hmm. that's an inside joke. I'll explain it. But but when I trained my baby prosecutors, I always said, listen, anybody can try a slam dunk case. You know, you do an undercover buy from a drug dealer. You got DNA. Anybody can try that. But the cases that really test you as a lawyer, that make you an Abraham Lincoln and Claire and Starrow, is when you have to rely on circumstantial evidence that you have to use your gift of oratory to persuade either the judge or jury that your person is guilty. That's what makes you a lawyer. Yeah, Dina, uh, just go to OJ. Uh, DNA evidence, it kind of went squirrely for them uh, in terms of its admissibility, cross-contamination, so on and so forth. Uh, that's where good common sense would have been good. Give me in 15 seconds or less your analysis about that. You just can't stop at the DNA. You got to know the case in case the jury rejects it. You know, yes and no. I think at the OJ hearing, people, this was new. It was very new, this idea of DNA, and people could easily be convinced go quick, that there was contamination. People right. are smartened are... up by now. Uh, okay, Dean, I'm sorry I had to cut you off, guys. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for our regularly scheduled program. My name's Bob Bianchi. I'll see you later in the week. Have a great week.